Hello and welcome to Preprints in Motion. Join us as we sit down with early career researchers and discuss their latest preprint and find out about their journey through the muddy marshes of academia. But we don't stop there. Every month we'll be bringing you special episodes with open science leaders where we discuss how to fix academia. Easy, right? So hit that subscribe button, leave a rating, or find us on Twitter at MotionPod. But for now, let's get into the show. Today we sit down with Michael Alexanian to discuss his latest preprint, a transcriptional switch governs fibroblast activation in heart disease. So thank you so much for agreeing to come on. Yeah, thanks for inviting me. This I think I think this this um this might be the most complex paper we've had on, I think. Quite technical. Yeah. I enjoy it though, because I've been doing some single cell RNA seek as well. So it was I was just like, ooh. <laughs> I know about this. <laughs> so thank you for joining us. And you have done a really cool paper that has just been published in Nature. So congratulations, I guess is how we should start. And you were looking at how stress from a disease state and those stress associated signaling pathways alter chromatin. And of course, one of those common things that we see happening in states of stress in a tissue is that you get fibroblast activation, which is something I worked on a long time ago. And You've done a really cool paper using RNA-seq and ATAC-seq to kind of get at this question of, of what's actually happening within the fibroblast. But this is quite a technical paper and I'm not sure what background our audience has. So I think as a starting point, it might be good if you could explain a little bit about what you did and, and what your main findings yeah, were. Yeah, sure. Um, so we, uh, at Gladstone Institute, we have an entire uh, floor that it's dedicated to cardiovascular disease. And uh, we've, been, uh, we've been knowing for a few years now that by inhibiting a class of proteins called bromo and extra terminal domain that are called bat proteins, those are proteins that bind open chromatin and coactivate transcription. So usually activators of gene expression and chromatin state, particularly in the context of stress, not only in the heart, but also in cancer and many other contexts. So we've been knowing for a few years that when we inhibit uh, this class of proteins with a drug, with a compound that it's called JK1, uh, we had a pretty amazing effect uh, in model of heart failure. Uh, what we do to these mice is that, uh, you know, we open the chest of these mice and we do some surgical interventions that over time will trigger heart failure, which basically means that and over time, the heart loses their ability to pump enough blood to meet each of them up. And uh, we knew that when we were giving JK1, the function was getting better, but really better. Like it was almost a magical effect. The function was going back to normal. And this has always been very puzzling to us. So when I started my postdoc, uh, I wanted to investigate how does it work? What are the mechanisms that are driving this uh, almost magical effect that this bad inhibition has in heart failure. And also I was interested in how dynamic it was because one observation I've done at the very beginning of my postdoc was that not only when we give this drug, the heart gets better, but when we withdraw it, when we stop giving it, the heart gets worse. And we have done other experiments where you would start and stop, start and stop, and the function goes up and down pretty crazy. It was so cool that it was so, so dynamic. That was amazing. So dynamic. And uh, this was puzzling to us. And we thought whether if it's so dynamic in organ function, there has to be something happening at the level of the tissue that might at least partially explain how easy that when we give this drug, the heart gets better. And when we stop it, the heart gets worse again. It was 2017 and... Uh, it was really the beginning of this uh, revolution of single cell genomics. Uh, there were this kit from this a company called Tenex Genomics that were coming available. And we decided that this project was uh, a very good one to start applying uh, these assays. And that's where we've done single cell and sick initially and single cell attack, which is a technology that enables us to capture open chromatin. So whenever the, open, uh, the, the chromatin is open, you get some signals and then you can integrate this with single cell and ASIC that look, uh, as you know, at gene expression on single cell level. And that's where the most revealing fact uh, happened 
by looking at the different cell types in the heart. There are many in the hearts. There are cardiomyocytes, there are the muscle, so the contractile units. There are immune cells, there are endothelial cells. There's obviously fibroblasts, as you mentioned. And we saw that within all the changes that were happening in, uh, in a lot of cell types, the most striking were in the fibroblast, where the transcriptome, so the gene expression of these cells, was, was basically toggling back and forward with the state of the disease and the exposure to the bad inhibitor. And that's where we thought, well, maybe we should look more closely to this cell types in this context. So, you know, RNA-seq and ATAC-seq are very good approaches to use together because they're incredibly complementary. Could you explain a little bit how you integrated those two approaches and, and what, what the benefit of doing that was? Yeah. So, uh, single cell RNA gives, gives, gives us a lot of information. I, mean, I shouldn't lie. Like, this uh, impressive result of the fibroblast was evident just by looking at gene expression because the, the toggling of the transcription was, uh, was there. What single, what single cell attack gave us was uh, an eye on the molecular mechanism that was uh, uh, partially at least explaining this dynamic uh, in transcriptome. So by integrating this tool, we were able, for example, to discover large open chromatin regions next to important genes that were dynamically opening and closing uh, in the disease state with the exposure of the drug. And one of it was this large enhancer next to this transcription factor called MIOX1 that we decided to investigate. So the first two figures are the landing ground of the fibroblast being very sensitive, and the last two figures is about this transcription factor that we think uh, controls, at least uh, in part, uh, the uh, stress response in fibroblast. So I would say very important for defining molecular mechanism, maybe less important in this extent to identify what are the cell types involved, because that was very clear with single cells. And, I, and you know, fibroblast, I was at a talk recently, um, and the, the guy was talking about how outside of the fibroblast field, people kind of, they, they um, I think they disregard fibroblast a little bit, because they're seen as this cell that doesn't really do all that much, quite often. Whereas, actually, uh, I mean, as someone who has worked on them, they're incredibly interesting cells, because they do more than I think people give them credit for. Um, and when I was working on them, what I was looking at is fibroblast subtypes, and trying to sort of distinguish these different phenotypes that fibroblasts can take on. So obviously you're, you're seeing one phenotype in, in your model. Did you look to see if there were other fibroblast phenotypes going on? Or did you get any data that might hint at that? Yeah, so I have to say that, uh, well, first of all, I obviously agree, although I'm not a fibroblast biologist and I landed on this cell type because it was the, the most evident in this context. It is true that they're incredibly interested in the context of stress response, both in the acute and I would say, especially in the chronic, because they probably do very different things, right? Uh, there's quite a lot of papers now, at least in the, in the cardiovascular field, to look at the different subpopulations of fibroblast post-injury. Now, our work was more interested in the different uh, drug treatment, because we had this beautiful system of giving a drug and withdrawing a drug. So we haven't really investigated in deep the different subpopulations. But I can tell you that there are, and with single cell RNA seq, we find different subclusters. Some of them uh, have uh, expression of stress markers that are higher than other ones. And uh, I think in the future, we might want to uh, look more in details about that. But I should say that this work was primarily focused on how the cell types react in the different disease state and with the pharmacological intervention. I mean, it's definitely an interesting future avenue to go down. Not that I recommend people look at subtypes. It's horribly complex uh, as someone who seems to be falling into that niche way too often. So this drug that you were using, uh, this JQ1 drug, do you know how that actually works? Is the, is the function behind that known? And maybe could you share how that works a little bit? Yeah, so this is a compound. Uh, uh, so this is a tool compound, and it's first in class. It was uh, discovered around 10 years ago. JQ1 doesn't have the pharmacological properties of a real drug, but now there are many bad inhibitors that are obviously not available for academic studies uh, that are now investigating many companies, especially in the context of cancer. Uh, the way JQ1 works, in you know, few words, is that these bad proteins that JQ1 inhibits 
they have a pocket by which they recognize open chromatin by uh, binding. These are called epigenetic readers, and they're, they actually read the, the code on the chromatin. And they bind especially K27, well, I should say acetylated lysine residues at the chromatin that usually are associated with open chromatin states. So what GT1 does is that it binds to the pocket uh, that, that uh, this uh, the, uh, bad province uses to recognize uh, this acetylated lysine residues and it, it, uh, it displays basically this bad proteins from the chromatin. So it acts as a displacement so that the bad proteins cannot bind these acetylated lysine residues anymore. And the effect is reversible and the, the half-life is very short. It's, it's, I would say three, four hours. I'm not a chemist, so I don't want to like talk a lot about that, but uh, you have to inject the G1 every day, which is pretty painful because you have to go to the mouse room and inject it. But the good things is that and that's what's very important in the context of the study. If you stop injecting GQ1, bad proteins will reload at those enhancers because GQ1 doesn't diminish the quantity of protein around, but just displaces them away from the chromatin. So it's a very it's important to make this this point. Is that is that how the is that similar to how the clinical drugs work as well? Yeah, it's very similar. Like the clinical drugs are just. Uh, a little bit more fancy molecules that are more specific. Uh, they, they are bio-orally available, which G1 it's not, and that's why we have to inject it uh, with an IP injection on the mouse, but they're very simple. The concept is it's, it's very simple. So presumably your findings would translate quite well then with other BET inhibitors. They would be quite clinically appropriate, I guess. Yeah, so I should say that we've done uh, a couple of tests with our compounds. Uh, I mean, the name is not that important, but that some companies are evaluated and uh, we see the same stuff. So we see a tremendous effect uh, in heart function and also effects in the transcriptum of the cardiac fiber. So I would say, yes, so that's probably translatable. Then uh, I should also say that there is an issue, some issue with, with toxicity of this compound because bad proteins are everywhere. They're not just in your sick heart doing bad stuff, but they're also everywhere doing good stuff. And that's also why I think this work is important because uh, it starts elucidating how uh, this pathway can uh, work downstream so that maybe we can design a little bit more tailored intervention rather than this uh, uh, sort of hammer, which is the benefit. And I, I guess one of those downstream interventions potentially could be one of your big hits, which was, as you mentioned, MIOX-1. Um, and that you found to be responsive to TGF beta stimulation, uh, and this is my understanding of this is this one is one of those sort of key regulators of fibroblast differentiation and function. Um, could you get into a little bit about how that works in fibroblast and what it's doing? So MIOX one uh, was a, a pretty clear hit for us because uh, when we ran these analyses of the chromatin states. Uh, uh, correlation with organ function, we found that uh, this large enhancer proximal to MIOX1 was one of the most regulated. And as the enhancer was regulated, also the gene in expression was very regulated. We found MIOX1 gene to be upregulated in stress in fibroblasts, so pretty lowly expressed in fibroblasts in a healthy heart, uh, strongly expressed in a heart failure, so in a heart that doesn't pump very well, and uh, the function, the expression of GQ1 was basically abolished by bad inhibition. And the most interestingly was coming up again when we were drawing the drug and the function was going down. So uh, MIOX1, it's a transcription factor. So I am interested in study gene regulation. So obviously for me, this was pretty revealing. Oh, wow, there is a transcription factor. That it's one of the most regulated genes. And second of all, MIOX1, it's not very well understood. Like if you PubMed MIOX1, you'll find that there are pretty few studies. Most of them are in development because MIOX1 is expressed very early in development in a population of cells called pariaxal mesoderm. And it's important for somatogenesis. Uh, I should say polarization of the scler scleroton in particular. But the role of MIOX1 in adult disease, it's not really understood. So for us, that was a, a very good hit because uh, it was also uh, pretty novel. And what we discovered, as you said, was that MIOX1 is very responsive to stress. 
and we can replicate the, this response in vitro, a very good way that fibroblasts, that uh, biologists have to study fibroblasts in stress is that you can put them in a plate, throw this molecule called uh, uh, PGA beta, which is a signaling molecule that triggers uh, this canonical stress response, and fibroblasts get activated. Well, it's not going to be as an in vivo organ, uh, obviously, but it's pretty close. And MIOX1 was overexpressed in this context, so it was a beautiful way for us to study how MIOX1 was uh, controlled. So what we've done, uh, I don't know how technical I should be, but let's, let me just say that we use several ways to understand how the enhancer controls MIOX1 expression, and then how MIOX1 is expressed in stress to bind, like the transcription factor would do, uh, genes that are important for this stress response and activate them. So that's in a few words how MIOX1 would work. I mean, it's amazing that you found an enhancer just upstream of a gene it was controlling. So my PhD, it, I wasn't looking at enhancers, but we were using enhancers as a, as a readout for, for what we were doing. And you know, enhancers are one of these things that are amazing because they can work sort of just upstream of a gene, or they can be activating and controlling a gene that is you know, millions of base pairs away from, from, where, from where they are. So I, that, that is amazing that you managed to find something that sort of nicely ties together like that. So you, you, you went in to look at MIOX1 and, and you found that when MIOX1 is lost, there's a reduction in genes. And could you explain a little bit about anything interesting that came out? Were there, were there any sort of pathways that were particularly promising from that, that could be potential pharmacological treatment targets? Yeah, so I should start by saying that this classical response of the five lost in stress, so usually it's associated with the two or three biological processes that the five lost when stress uh, really triggered. And uh, one, it's uh, migration. So five lost, they start to migrate, uh, they proliferate, and then they secrete uh, extracellular matrix. So there's proteins that, uh, uh, that are secreted by the fibroblast. And what they do in, in an organ, well, usually they do very good things, right? They're, they're important for the structure of the organ. But in stress, uh, uh, the fibroblast uh, start uh, secreting this uh, extracellular matrix protein and they don't stop. <laughs> they just don't have a way to stop. And then these increase a lot the stiffness, the rigidity of the organ. And that's obviously very detrimental in the context of a heart, which is a pump. And the pump, this pump relies on the ability of contracting and decontracting, right? So this fibrous response in proliferation, migration, and secretion of extracellular matrix, it's very detrimental long-term in a chronic state for the heart. And we found that when inhibiting uh, MIOX1, all these three pathways that the fibroblast uh, uh, trigger in stress were strongly diminished. Proliferation, collagen production, extracellular matrix production, and, and also uh, and migration. So I think that MIOX1 might be upregulating stress to control fibroblast states in stress uh, by uh, uh, triggering multiple biological processes that the fibroblast undergo. So it really is a, a, a key sort of regulator then of the whole pathway. Yes, we are key regulators of, of fibroblast uh, in stress so downstream of the TGA beta signaling. And that's very important because uh, you guys might, might know that uh, I think, I remember someone telling me, uh, well, several people in companies in, the in, in industry settings telling me that the reason a signaling pathway like TGA beta where you know, the companies have uh, put more money, like TGA beta, it's probably at the top. Because that's a very important signal in cancer. Obviously, we a lot of money for research. It's important in development. It's important in fibrosis, and that, that's known. Uh, the problem is that because it's so, it's so important for many things, inhibiting TGA beta signaling, it's also pretty detrimental and comes with a lot of secondary effects. So I think it's uh, intriguing and important as we understand more about the gene regulation downstream of this uh, signaling, that we discover how uh, this might work because this might inform us new targets. Now, MIOX1 is a transcription factor, which are usually defined as undragable targets, and they're very difficult to target, but it doesn't have to be MIOX1. It could be something downstream of MIOX1. So I think that these works are important 
not only for elucidating the biology, but also to inform maybe where to look for new targets. And that, that is one of the key benefit of this kind of approach, isn't it? It's, it's that you can hopefully provide something that means we can have treatments that are much better, much more specific and a lot safer. Um, I, I'm currently writing a grant at the moment, so my head's very much based on proteomes. And I was wondering, because it, it's, it's a very logical step for your work, you, you've looked at the gene level, you've looked at the epigenetic level. Uh, have you thought about looking at the proteome of what's going on here as well? Or is that is that maybe something you're planning to do as a follow-up work? Yeah. Well, first of all, uh, good luck for the grants. As we know, they're, they're key in our survival. Well, uh, we haven't done it in, in this for this specific paper. Also because obviously, as we know, uh, evaluating the program at a single cell level, it's uh, extremely more difficult than, than looking at gene expression. But I should say that one of the things that we have done now is to uh, make a new mouse model where we insert an epitope flag in the MIOX1 logs. So that uh, uh, when MIOX1, uh, when the protein of the transcription factor MIOX1 is around, is expressed, is going to also have a flag epitope. And that's because the antibodies for MIOX1 are very, very poor. Uh, so we can't really use them. So uh, what I'm trying to do now is to look at what interacts in terms of protein partners with MIOX1 in stress, uh, hopefully from in vivo, but that might be more difficult. But then if you make a MIOX1 flag mouse, you can also make fibroblasts from this mouse and then treat them with TGA beta to look in that context what interacts with MIOX1. So definitely something very important, especially for what we were saying before, right? That MIOX1 might be undruggable, but what interacts with MIOX1 and helps him in the function of uh, triggering stress in fibroblasts might be uh, druggable. Mm. So this is, I mean, it's really cool to get published in Nature, but this started life as a preprint. Was that your decision to post up on BioArchive? Yeah, absolutely. I'm a, I'm a big fan of uh, uh, preprints. That's, that's what we want to hear. I, I think them, I think them as, a, as maybe the most important revolution that I have seen happening uh, in the last years in research. Obviously, I'm, I'm not that old, so <laughs> I might be biased in this, but I think they're, they're really important. And uh, for me, there was no discussion. I haven't thought about that a single moment. The moment I sent the paper uh, to Nature without knowing the outcome, and you know that most of the paper would get best rejection. So before even know whether the paper was evaluated, I posted it online. So for me, there was no discussion. And I would say that the lab generally do that, but it's also something that usually comes from the trainings. That, that's, that, that's good. I think that it, often it does come from, because I think the biggest benefit of preprints are all the early career research. I think lab heads have a bit less of an impetus to, to actually do that because they're kind of the safer, they, they don't need to get the paper out as quickly. Whereas, you know, we, we need that. Yeah, while it's raining, uh, uh, they, they would. Uh, and I should say that uh, the paper, the preprint got uh, quite a lot of attention. There was some articles written on it. I should thank uh, the pre-lighters uh, that uh, highlight uh, uh, my, our paper with a beautiful uh, article. I actually stole some of their concept. I said, you guys wrote it almost better than I would do. It's crazy. <laughs> Uh, and, and then you get invited to talks because you, people know about your work. So I would really recommend every train to put their work in by archive or any preprints. Uh, em, Emma and I are both pre liars so it, it's good. To, we don't very often get to hear what the, what the authors actually think when we do these. So it's good. It's good to know it's received so well. Yeah. I was absolutely delighted of seeing this, uh, and it was a beautiful article. And then I, I got to meet the one of the author of the of the article, and then we we had a Zoom, and now we're doing something together. So uh, this is how it should. Be. Yeah, I, I, one of my big collaborators I got from initially writing a, a prelight article on his work, and it was incredibly productive after that, uh, which I didn't expect when I joined prelights. But there you go. If any, if anyone wants to join prelights, there's there's an advert for prelights. <laughs> yeah. I mean, publishing in Nature, with that being the aim in mind, did you have any reservations about putting on BioArchive? No. No. Okay, good. Yeah, because one, you know, one, one of the things you get, a lot of people are a bit reluctant if they're going to publish them on those high-impact journals sometimes. 
Yeah, well, uh, obviously, when I when I put it uh, there, I didn't know about uh, any of the outcome. You know, you you can start to with nature and then and then not getting there. Uh, I I didn't think about uh, where I was going. I just thought that I had to do it. I I would I wasn't thinking about a single reason why not to do that. So I know that people have uh, some issues sometimes uh, because they they're also scared about uh, you know putting the work there. If there are other people working on it, then my you know, speed up some some work, but I would say that it's better to have it there with the date, uh, so that you can say, well, you know, the 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 paper was there. Look at look at it. That, that's what we keep. That's what we keep saying to you. <laughs> so one of the things I found interesting. So I um some of the work I've been doing has been to look at how preprints have been used during the pandemic, and one of those papers was comparing a preprint to its published version to see whether or not preprints were reliable. Was the the angle we were using. And one of the things we found was that actually, for the most part, um, the key messages between a preprint and a paper, they they don't change, they stay the same. And this was interesting on the, so you did a nice little Twitter thread of your paper and somebody asked you this question and it wasn't me. Um, You you mentioned that, you know, your key messages didn't change. So if that's the case, what's your view on the peer review process? Wow. Uh, I should say, I I should be politically correct. (laughs) Uh, that's a uh, well, let me start by saying that uh, my my experience, at least this experience and nature, was uh, was pretty good. Uh, we had a very good uh, connection with the with the editor that uh, really liked the paper from the very beginning, and uh, the four reviewers also uh, like it. As I replied in that you know tweet, uh, if you compare the two work, honestly, there isn't a lot of difference. The most important experiments and findings were there in July 2020, and they're still here in in the Nature version. I should mention that the reviewers were very helpful in highlighting something that we might that we could strengthen in terms of adding more controls or doing some orthogonal validation of some of our findings, and we uh, we appreciated the reviewers uh, for that. But I should also say that. uh, Everybody could see by comparing the two, uh, the two papers that uh, honestly the manuscript did not change in the main message. That that I mean that that backs up what we found. And when you talk to people, it, that seems to be the anecdotal evidence is that peer review generally will strengthen your paper a bit, but ultimately it doesn't really change the main message very often. But yeah, I think it's always good to, to talk about that because I think my opinion is that we need to rethink how peer review currently works. I don't think it's particularly useful in its current form. Yeah, I, I agree. That's not an important topic. Yeah. So one of the things you do outside of science, which is incredibly cool, is you teach improv theatre. I, I assume this is something that relaxes you a lot when you're away from the lab. But does is this something that you can bring skills from that back into the lab? Is this something like, I know some people who do um, comedy nights. And so when they're giving a scientific talk, they can kind of bring those skills in for that. Yeah. Well, that, that's how I sell it at least. <laughs> <laughs> The people that attend, yes. <laughs> so I hope, yes. Yes, absolutely. I had, uh, I always had a, a, a passion for theater and uh, uh, then I developed as a passion for improv when I moved to Switzerland for my uh, PhD. And then when I got here, together with uh, another postdoc, uh, she's in UCSF, she also had uh, a lot of experience with improv. We thought, well, why don't we bring our uh, experience to the community in the Bay Area? There's, there's many universities here. And uh, to answer your question, yes, uh, that's what we always try to achieve uh, is to uh, try to develop uh, some communication skills, some creativity, some ability to respond to cues that are unexpected so that we can take this package and then translate it to any discussion about science uh, whether it's a podcast, whether it's a talk, uh, uh, whether our it's a relationship with a colleague where you're, where you're trying to establish, uh, we think as communication in science as as important as the science itself. So uh, I'm, I'm very excited about this uh, and I'm also excited to, to see that uh, a lot of scientists at UCSF uh, appreciate this. And we, we strongly agree. We, uh, we had a chat yesterday with uh, a bunch of science communicators and yeah, we, we, that is one of the, I think, the most important skills uh, a scientist can have. So another thing you've done is you've traveled a lot, probably not so much at the moment. 
But how does that feed back into the science? So I, I'm I've someone who's I've never stayed in one place too long, although I've never managed to leave the UK either for work. So I mean, presumably working with a lot of different people, that must really be incredibly beneficial for how you think and how you you approach what you're doing in the lab. Yeah, yeah. So I would I would say that you know a, a lot of time we think about. Uh, moving in science as a way to get exposed to new science and new techniques, but uh, that's obviously important. But I, I would argue that uh, it's, it, it's even more important that this moving around gets you exposed to new countries, new culture, new way of thinking. And this way of thinking are you know, crucial for navigate life, not only when you do daily stuff, but also in the way you uh, relate to your colleagues. So for me, it was very important to uh, move a lot because every time that you move, you, you learn new things. And I think your, your soft skills also increase and your ability to connect with people increase. So I would, uh, I would strongly recommend people to do that. And I think uh, that of the many positive things that the life of of a scientist has and some negative things. The idea of being able to move. A lot of my friends back in Italy, and they do exciting uh, jobs also, uh, don't have this opportunity because if you're you're a lawyer, you're a lawyer in Florence, Italy, you probably won't uh, be a a lawyer in San Francisco, but if if you're a scientist, you're a scientist everywhere. we should exploit these uh, as a way to travel the world and, and get to know what's... Yeah, I, I try it. It's just every time I try it, I end up in London. Which all my conferences have been in London. And it's just sad. It's um, Hopefully next year, there's one in Mexico. Okay, well, Mexico is a great place. <laughs> so it's, it's, you know, out of all the places you've been, do you have a, a favourite place to live or work? Are they separate places? I well, uh, let me let me think about that. Like I think that uh, different phases in life uh, probably better matches with different places. Uh, now I'm I'm European. I'm from Italy, so I have to say that uh, working and living in Switzerland for me uh, was very good because I found Switzerland to be an incredibly good uh, country, not only for the quality of life but also the quality of science. And it's very well positioned. So if you ask me where would you want to go back, I would say that going back in a place where I can travel to mm. Italy, Spain, France in an hour, uh, it would be uh, my dream. Yeah, I hear that a lot about Switzerland. It's just it's an amazing place to live. So is, are there any tips you would give to people who travel for navigating that kind of constant moving? I could, I could say that... Uh, it does get to a little bit more difficult with the age. So I would <laughs> strongly recommend people to try uh, to navigate these and move a lot uh, when they're a little bit younger because the problem is, well, it's not a problem, but that's how life it is. Mm. As you get uh, a little bit older and grow, it's a little bit more difficult uh, uh, to move. <laughs> Yeah, you know, I've become an expert at packing with the amount of moves I've had in the past two years. And new houses also, new, you know, new, house, new house, new inter stuff. It's always the same stuff <laughs> that repeats. Yeah, I uh, last last I moved last year a couple of times last year, and I just didn't unpack for about a year and a half. <laughs> I just stayed packed because it was just easier. Yeah, it's better. You stay packed and then just you move the pack. <laughs> much much easier than unpacking. Um, so I, th- I think, I think that is all of my questions I have, because that was a really good chat. Oh, I just remembered something I didn't mention. So you, uh, I, are you still on the job market? Yes, I am. I am interviewing around and uh, I should try to come to Europe, although now it's still pretty difficult for, for some visiting. So uh, uh, that's what I'm doing now. I'm, uh, I'm evaluating positions in academia uh, and also some of them in industry and we'll see what happens. But yes, I'm on the job market. We should advertise it. We should say, I am on the job market. <laughs> there you go. And you, you, your work is incredible. So people will be mad not to snap you up. Wow. Thank you. You're, you're very optimistic. I, uh, <laughs> I'll be optimistic too then. Thank you. <laughs> it's, it's all you can do. You've got to stay optimistic in science. Okay. Well, thank you so much for coming on. Wow, thanks to you. It was a nice chat. Uh, thanks for uh, giving me the opportunity of uh, talking about uh, my work and also some of the experience in science and life. Oh, I loved it. Well, 
Where do I find out about the different bioarchive licenses? This CC, BY, CDXY nonsense is driving me nuts. Hey, that bio have a resource for that? Ugh, that's your answer to everything. That's because they have everything you need to know about preprints. Sure, they probably have the basics, like info on the preprint service, but what else is there? There's so much more. Looking to post a preprint, but not sure what different journal policies are? They have a collection to help you out with that. There are meetings around preprints and associated services. If you want to know how preprint adoption has changed over time, there's even a page on that. And COVID? They have a big section on preprints and the pandemic, plus some really cool infographics for communicating preprints. And university policies? Sure, they don't have that. They collect uni policies where possible. Okay, okay, they do sound pretty impressive, but is it not a bit of an echo chamber? It can be, but ASAP Bio also engage with people who don't love preprints and have concerns. So we had an excellent discussion on this very topic a couple of months ago. Oh, is there anything ASAP Bio don't do? Honestly, no, they're so nice over there. They were so quick to jump in and support this show. It's your one-stop shop for info on preprints and open science initiatives. So head over to asapbio.org to learn more and subscribe to their newsletter for the latest in preprint news. If you want a deeper dive into the world of preprints, then look out for the next recruitment of ASAP Bio Fellows. Okay, and that is the show. If you enjoyed listening, then hit that subscribe button for more and leave us a review on whatever platform it is you're listening on. You can reach out to us on Twitter at MotionPod or online at preprintsandmotion.com. Didn't enjoy that? Well, we're all scientists here, so send us your review and let us know what works or what you'd like to hear more of, or less of. But until next time, have a good week.